Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About It. This is Susan Johnson, and my co-host is off doing great things, actually watching our grandchild play softball. So we're having a good time. She's got quite an arm. She can really throw a pitch, and he is so proud, and so am I. So that's where he is today, And uh, but we have a wonderful guest for you today, uh, somebody who is uh, going to be running for the 48th House District. Uh, uh, that would be Chris Rivers. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, congratulations on your nomination. I really appreciate it. It was a good overall opportunity to gather Democrats from a couple different towns. It was just a good night. I remember I went to uh, some of those when Linda Orange ran, uh, and uh, uh, we really had a wonderful relationship with Linda. And then we were lucky that, uh, unfortunately, poor Linda passed away, right. and uh, we certainly miss her. And uh, But we have Brian Smith right now as the state representative, and he also has been wonderful. So we have great people coming from Colchester uh, representing the 48th House District. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, especially I never had the privilege of meeting Linda, but I've been able to get to know Brian pretty well. And for anyone in elected office, character really matters, whether you agree with them or don't agree with them. We all have our personal views, and I hope that we do disagree at points because that means we're all actually thinking. And Brian is one of those people you just look at and say, that is someone of character and that I would always want to sit down and have a beer with and just talk about the world. Yes, indeed. I've always uh, enjoyed his perspective. And, uh, you know, we have very similar uh, backgrounds in that. He worked in a lot of law firms and I worked at legal services. And so both of us worked as paralegals and he went on to be management in the law office and I went on to be a lawyer. But, uh, you know, that kind of background really, uh, he and he did different areas. I did the Medicare, Medicaid. He did more business and finance uh, type of uh, legal work. So it was really a wonderful, good experience and uh, good information information from uh, Representative Smith. So, so, but uh, now you uh, have an amazing background as well, and I want, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been doing, and I was struck when I was reading uh, the, uh, some of your history that you were in high school about the time that the horrible tragedy with 9-11 occurred, and that set something off in your mind about how you wanted to uh, move forward and work and help for the, help our country. Yeah, that's right. It was, you know, growing up in Connecticut, I was born and raised in a community. Part of my second family was the Episcopal Church. And I always had something in me that said, from a very early age, I just wanted to help people. And I was in high school. I was actually in a video communications class when 9-11 was happening. So we had news playing in the classroom when it was happened and got home that night. My sister couldn't really understand what was happening in the world. None of us really understood it that same day. But after seeing those towers go down, knowing some friends who had family members who were in those towers is when I decided I don't quite yet know what I want to do with my life, but I know I want to serve others. And that took me to having a conversation with an Army National Guard recruiter for the great state of Connecticut. And I was the first one in my family to go to a four-year college. And I thought at the time, well, if I'm going to serve my country... Anyways, might as well get educated while I do it. So my might as well enlist in the National Guard can do both of them at the same time. And talking to that National Guard recruiter really set me on a trajectory that has sustained me all the way to now putting service first. That's wonderful. And uh, so tell us, uh, so you did go into the Guard and, and, and you were going to school and you did all that. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of things to take on. Um, and uh, tell me, uh, where did you go and, and what did you, where did the uh, Guard bring you? Yeah, so I did basic training between my junior and senior summer of high school. Mm -hmm. I was 17 at the time. My first trip down south to experience the South Carolina and heat. And got back to high school, finished up my high school experience. And at that point, I graduated high school in 2004 to date myself for anyone listening to this. <laughs> and the National Guard had deployments going. When I first started in the National Guard, no one deployed pretty much anywhere. By the time you're a year into it, National Guard units are deploying all around the world. And so I deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom. The unit was based out of Kuwait, made my way up into Iraq and back down again, took my SATs in Kuwait. Oh, boy. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I think I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's done that. I don't think there's very many of us out there. So and from there decided, you know what? My original plan was to go to University of Connecticut terrific college, mm -hmm. but because I was in the Army, because I was in Kuwait serving in Operation Iraqi Freedom, took my SATs and said, 
I should really apply to West Point and had some officers that were in my supervisory chain of command say, you really should. Yeah. And so I filled out my application just like every other student does, except I sent mine in from overseas rather than sending it from here home in Connecticut. And luckily enough, got accepted into West Point um, and went to the West Point prep school for a year and then went to study physics and nuclear engineering as an undergrad at West Point, joined the skydiving team to overcome my fear of heights and ultimately met my wife. We had exactly one date at West Point and we didn't start dating again until after. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> that's very impressive. So I, I can't imagine. I, I've always wanted to do parachuting, but uh, I, you know, to address your fear of height in doing that, uh, that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. It was, How does that work? <laughs> it was probably not the smartest way to overcome a fear of heights, but West Point has this team to go around jumping into our own football games mm -hmm. to demonstrate for people what skydiving can do. And since they have the team figure out as a tryout no one who's trying out for the team really has a lot of skydiving experience so it's pretty equal as long as you want it you fill out a packet do a physical tryout to see how much you want it and then you're on the team by the time they invest so much into you to do the training mm -hmm. you kind of just go through it and since i had deployed already i figured i can overcome my fear in order to jump out of at west point helicopters not even airplanes Oh, yeah, that's even more uh, interesting, isn't it? A helicopter is uh, uh, even a, a more trying kind of a thing in the air. I mean, uh, an airplane, at least, you know, you have a more of a sense, I think, of, uh, uh, I don't know, is it balance or, or where you are? And, and the helicopter seems to me like it would be uh, just a little bit str more odd. It is a lot more odd. You're sitting, and it was the old Huey helicopter, oh. just like you would see in the Vietnam War yeah. movies. Uh -huh. uh, there was... West Point had the last remaining Huey in active duty service, and you sit in it with your hand, with your legs dangling out. Oh so if you're already afraid of heights, <laughs> taking off in a Huey to go up to jump out of it, you get up to about 2,000 feet, take off your seatbelt, sorry, 2,000 feet above the ground, take off your seatbelt, and you're not connected to the aircraft anymore. You're just sitting there with half your body out of it, and it's terrifying, and it's amazing because having those moments where you know you're going to be scared and have to overcome it, are the moments where you realize the power in your own way of thinking and you get to choose your own frame of reference. And so you can choose to let it overcome you and just not do anything, or you can choose to pay attention to the training and overcall what, or sorry, overcome what the skydiving community would call sensory overload. Uh huh. Yes. And fast forward to today with all of the craziness going on in the world, there is sensory overload all the time. Just instead of fast winds and heights and fear of heights, it's smartphone news feeds and what's going on politically across the country or what's going on internationally with wars popping up all over the place. And to be able to stay focused on what actually matters to people kind of, for me, really started with realizing I can overcome it, starting with skydiving. That's wonderful. Wow. That's a, that's a fabulous explanation because I think that a lot of times people uh, back away from things they're afraid of and uh, they don't he face them head on and, and you face that head on and you really learned a lot from facing it head on. I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about what how important it is to have a group of people that want to be in that same frame of reference with you. The people you have around you says just as much about who you are as what you're doing, I think. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's very true. And I think also how you overcome things that are, you know, you, you have concerns about uh, and you face them and you figure them out. And I think figuring stuff out, at least for me, is something that I always want to know. I want to know how it works. I want to figure it out. I want to just understand uh, things. And this is just uh, what you did with the, with the, your fear of height and skydiving is you figured it out and you understood what it was and you understood how to overcome it and face it, which is just, it's a phenomenal thing to do, really. Yeah, thank you. And I could credit a lot of that to my dad, too. So my dad, growing up as a mechanic, mm -hmm. he still is a mechanic. Uh -huh. He is basically a genius, like MacGyver was a genius. Like, mm -hmm. he can fix anything with a coat hanger and coffee can. Mm -hmm. I don't truly understand how it works, but that kind of inner passion to always figure it out. I ended up turning on myself initially, then after West Point, I became an army engineer and started figuring out for my soldiers and for what we had to do as being an army engineer and happy to dive into that and unpack that a little bit. And ultimately led me into a world of policy, mm -hmm. led me into a world of uh, international policy, domestic policy, and figuring out how government can work better. And a lot of that is just 
figuring out how it actually works in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> and then figuring out what do we actually need to change to make it work better. Exactly. That's exactly uh, fabulous. And, and you know, I have to just share with you, my brother's a, a, a mechanic, but he can fix anything. I would, I've had, I've actually hired people to help me out with as electricians, but I, then I call him up on the phone and say, this didn't work. What should I do? He gives me the right answer on the phone without even looking. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> he's the guy, that kind of guy. And I think that if he had, you know, stayed in school. He just likes to tinker and fix. Ever since he was a little boy, he was taking everything apart. And you know, and then when he was little, he didn't put it back together. <laughs> but then, right. but then as he got older, everything went back together, and it went back together very, very well. So I just had to share yeah. that with you because I think it's all part of understanding where you are and really drilling down into how things work. And I think as policymakers, we really have to do that. We have to get what we're making policy about and how it works. And then, you know, you're never going to know every single impact of every single policy, but you should have an idea of where it's going and what it's going to do. And I think that that's that background that you have is perfect. So you went, uh, so then you went, you went to Afghanistan. That's right. So after graduating West Point, got lucky enough to be stationed in Hawaii, which is where my wife and I truly started dating. And I really say lucky enough at West Point, everything is based on your order of merit. So part of it was luck that those above me ranked in the class who were better cadets than I was or had better grades, at least uh, chose to go to other places. Hawaii was still open. I picked it. Loved living in Hawaii for a couple of years. But Hawaii is a great place to return to and a horrible place to deploy from. <laughs> yes, I would just say that you're probably right. I can't imagine uh, going to a war zone from a beautiful place like Hawaii. Yeah, and <laughs> it's tough to go to. And I deployed as a lieutenant to Afghanistan from 2011 to 2012. And as an Army engineer, like most Army engineers in that time frame, we were doing what the Army calls route clearance or driving around really slow looking for every explosive device that's buried in a road mm. and got to do that for an entire year with some of the most amazing American soldiers you'll ever meet, um, some of whom have gone all across the Army, some of them are still in, many have gotten out, but returning from Afghanistan into Hawaii was pretty phenomenal. And one of the things that I realized in Hawaii, we we're on a mission, our missions will last us 30 straight days oftentimes of just being outside the wire, as we would call it, trying to find these explosive devices. And on one of those missions, one of my trucks hit an explosive device, about 100 pounds of explosives. Those three soldiers were medevac. They all survived. Um, but the next 27 days, I got to sit on a hillside in Afghanistan realizing I can design a nuclear reactor. I can design a nuclear weapon if you really wanted me to. I have this amazing world-class education from West Point, and I don't really understand why we're still here 10 years after the fact. I understand why we went there in the first place, but I couldn't understand what kept us there for so long, and that was just the halfway point looking back at it now. And I couldn't understand, I couldn't tell, tell myself a convincing story of how the government acted in order to make these decisions at the highest levels. And so that is what I said. I don't know what I want to do next. I want to keep serving people, but I also want to spend some time to study how our government actually works. And so what did you uh, finally decide in terms of the length of time that we were there at the point that you were there and the continuation? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people look at what happened in Afghanistan over the last couple of years and say it's a big mistake of how we did it at the last step. I would say, after doing a lot of soul searching and spending a lot of time and energy and blood and sacrifice there, for me, I think there was a lot of mistakes made along the ways. Mm -hmm. In military circles, um, some of the most strategic thinkers that we have will really harp on the importance of getting the big idea right. And I think in Afghanistan, global war on terror, 9-11 just happened. All of us were afraid. And I think it's important to remember that, to remember that mistakes were made by well-meaning people yep. and decisions were made that we can disagree with, especially in hindsight. But I think one of the fundamental things that we got wrong as a country was thinking that this is a military problem when it wasn't just a military problem. It was going to be a political problem. It was going to be a diplomatic problem, economic problem. And you can go in and you can overthrow the Taliban for hosting Osama bin Laden who launched the attacks. But I think we probably should have decided either to do it in a very light and quick way and get out immediately after if we didn't think there was going to be a long-term 
uh, benefit of us being there. And the mission that we've had since then is how do we keep Afghanistan from being a safe haven for terror against the United States? And I think if you're going to have a sober look at what does it take to actually do that, you have to look at countries where we've done it well. And that is Japan, Germany, South Korea, places that we still have troops in today after World War II. That's the sort of time frame and commitment that if you wanted to really go in and ensure that there wasn't going to be a second 9-11 from Afghanistan, that was probably the time frame we needed to be thinking of. But constantly, every administration since it was initially launched is talking timetables, how do we get out? And I understand it's expensive, but a lot of those debates I think should have been happened up front more than they actually were. And I think we as a country do better off when we have a more long-term view. And yet most of our political systems tend to incentivize a more short-term view. Sure. Well, if we have our elections every four years and you have turnover uh, every two years in Congress with with respect to the House and every six years in the Senate, you don't have that kind of stability that maybe would be found in other places uh, in this. Uh, and you have huge shifts and change in, in terms of uh, policy. Yeah. As we've seen, uh, it gets more and more extreme all the time from the time when I was growing up, which was a few years ago, uh, <laughs> to, to today, uh, where I see really big, big shifts in, in, uh, in how we look at uh, the differences and how we look at the country and so and how what we should be doing. So I, I think, too, it seemed to me that I find it odd that there was, seemed to be a lot of money going into trying to keep the Taliban there while we were there. But then all of a sudden, and I'm not talking about the money that the um, that NATO and, and uh, the United States paid to keep uh, keep the democracy or keep a, a change in the government going. I'm talking about the money that somehow came in from places like Saudi Arabia to keep the Taliban active and, uh, and places like that that had a different objective than that. So there's all of it. And then all of a sudden now, all of a sudden the resources seem to be gone from both ends. And it seems to me that if they wanted the Taliban to really work, why aren't they still giving them the money, like Saudi Arabia? Why aren't they still funding them? Why isn't pa they, those that segment of Pakistan that, that supported the Taliban, why aren't they uh, providing those resources? And I, 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 I'm at a loss to try and figure that out. I think the answer, and this is going to be an overly simplistic view, but I think it can be found in that there's a bunch of countries in the region yep. that really benefit from a just stable enough Afghanistan to be able to handle itself, but no more than that, because once they do have more power, more ability to mobilize outside the borders of Afghanistan, then it becomes a problem for the rest of Afghanistan. It becomes a problem for the rest of the Middle East. It could become a problem even for countries like China. And so if you look at who has invested very heavily in the natural resources in Afghanistan, China's invested very heavily. Pakistan spent a lot of money through their intelligence system to prop up the Taliban, but a lot of that money is drying up. Um, and the Taliban was supported for a very long time on the drug trade, which affects all these countries as well. And so now that they're back in power, um, which is personally, I think a disaster, but- It certainly is, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, that, I don't think very, very many people or very many Americans will disagree with that, it's, regardless it's, of what side of the political spectrum you're on. Exactly. Um, but now they're back in power, there's a real question of, can they even afford to stay in power? is the drug trade enough to keep them sustained? And most of the experts that I've heard don't think it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of countries in the region are betting on to keep Afghanistan weak, but just stable enough to not be a problem for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very, very interesting. It's the first I've heard that, and thank you for that information because it's it's been a puzzle in my mind. Uh, and whenever you hear any chat about it, it's always, uh, you know, well, how we got out, which was uh, now they've done a study that shows that, well, that Trump started the mission to leave and then Biden finished it because he didn't want to add more troops. And then, of course, there was the person who was acting as president who just, just left uh, and so that's the latest study uh, that they've come out with. I haven't seen the full and or read the full, you know, report, but uh, it is something that uh, I do want to take a look at. Just to, but your your information and insight from having been there is is really quite fascinating. Yeah, it's it's quite a different country. The, yes, yes. The tribal nature of the area I was with in, which was Helmand Province, mostly, um, they really. They really fundamentally believe in their historic honor code way of living. 
Mm -hmm. And as an American going into it, if you learn their language, learn a little bit about their culture, you can use it to really get the most out of them from wanting to protect themselves to the idea of like my tribe, i.e. my U.S. soldiers, your tribe, someone from your tribe or someone that was staying in your tribe attacked my guys. So now like I'm entitled to revenge, but we can avoid that if we can just come to an agreement. And if you're willing to learn the language as you went and willing to learn the history, which I think too few Americans are willing to do, um, it is part of their culture. It's part of how they exist. And I think part of the big picture that we also got wrong is when we try to bring our very advanced combat systems, when we try to bring our very advanced supply lines, because the American military, second to none in the world, still to this day, um, and it should be, it should absolutely be far surpass everything. But it means that our supply chains are global in nature. It means that our technology that we use is super complicated. And when you're operating in a very outdated or basically like an ancient desert and you don't have access to the supply lines because you're not an American, the logistics of it is going to break down. And I think that's why you saw the government of Afghanistan forces crumble so much because they saw all the contractor support leave. And anyone who's done anything in the military, and Napoleon was the first one, I think, to coin this phrase, and I'm going to butcher it, so don't quote me on it, but it's tactics are for amateurs, um, logistics is for pro professionals. Interesting. That is that is absolutely fascinating. Boy, what wonderful experience you have. Uh, it's just like a, a, a big crash course in how things work. <laughs> and and uh, so I'm going to stop here because we're going to have a break uh, with our sponsors. This is Susan Johnson. I'm here with Chris Rivers. He is the Democratic nominee uh, for state representative in the 48th House District. And we will be right back after these messages. Welcome back, everyone. This is Susan Johnson. I'm here with Chris Rivers, who is the Democratic nominee for the 48th House District. And we were just having a wonderful talk about his experience as a soldier uh, and uh, in Afghanistan and his perceptions. And he has gone on from there uh, uh, to, uh, to the state, right? So right. So after going back from Afghanistan, was in Hawaii, getting ready for another deployment, that deployment for me personally never happened. And then the Army sent me to what they call a Captain's Career Course for Engineers. That's at Fort Leonard Wood mm -hmm. in the middle of Missouri, which was a phenomenal place to be if you enjoy the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And at that school, you learned the doctrine of, that you were supposed to learn. So for my time in the military, we're all fighting Iraq, Afghanistan, what we call counterinsurgency. What you learn at Career Course is how to make sure we know how to fight the Russians or another near peer adversary, um, which allows us to look at what's going on in Ukraine right now and analyze it from a real military perspective, even though we didn't actually have to fight that sort of war. And from there, I went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where I worked at the Center for Army Analysis as what the Army would call an ORSA, or Oper Operational Research and Systems Analyst, what the rest of the world would probably call a data scientist. And the role of the Center for Army Analysis is to support the Army at large for um, Pentagon planning purposes, budgetary reasons, and also common operating or what's happening around the world with the kind of reach back, super big brain analytical perspectives on things. Like they're the <laughs> ones to do the real simulations, what they would do, what they would call war gaming, and basically crunch the data to answer the questions for the units and the commanders who are in places like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, so you must have some perspective on the war with uh, Ukraine and Russia. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, tons. <laughs> Probably more than, more, than, more than I have, for sure. I mean, I think we can all look at it and realize uh, a couple different things. One, the NATO alliance yep. is so worthwhile. Yes. And I think what you're seeing with Finland and Sweden submitting their applications to join NATO is finally after decades and decades and decades of saying we want to be neutral because we don't want to be targeted and then they're looking at what happened in georgia they're looking at what happened in crimea they're looking at what happened in syria and now they're looking at what's happening in ukraine and says well it doesn't really matter if we play neutrality we're going to get attacked eventually anyways and i think a lot of um a lot of us chilling out here in eastern connecticut have the luxury of being 
living in the world's most powerful country that has ever existed. And I think what we often forget is what it's like to live in another country where you really do have to worry about your neighbor, where you have to worry that uh, Russia took Estonia off of the internet for about a week back in, I think, 2009, if I remember right. The cyber attacks and just Russia being able to throw its weight around all throughout the region. And now, obviously, everyone has seen what's happening in Ukraine, that Russia, I think, is not intent to just be a second tier power anymore. I think for domestic reasons, Putin and his regime um, want to be seen as what the old Soviet Union was seen as. Mm -hmm. And we as a country should probably take that and rethink our national security posture. And I don't want to alarm anyone listening to this. We have been looking at it. Uh, that's why if you go read the national security strategies, the last couple that have been published, you're talking about bringing back great power conflict, which is the ultimate doctrine or, in other words, philosophy that says we as a military, as our military arm of our national power, should be really focused on either the rising challenge that China presents or Russia, and to be able to make sure we can deter them so we don't have to fight wars. And if we ever do have to fight them, we can beat them convincingly. I think that uh, Biden's recent trip, uh, he's in hes in uh, Taiwan now, and he's making the rounds in the area and uh, going to Japan. I think those are the kinds of things that uh, will help strengthen us and uh, show that we're you know, we're we're there. We're we're you know we're we're players. We're we're doing that work, and we're connecting with these countries. And I think it's a counterbalance to uh, what has been going on the last uh, few, uh, you know, well, at least the last uh, let's say four years, where uh, there has been a, a more of a connection, say, with uh, with Russia and trying to pull away from NATO. And I think that you know NATO is uh, something that. Uh, has been a, really a great st stabilizing force since World War II, and uh, something that, as I was a little kid, uh, yeah. you know, it was uh, something that we were quite quite pleased with, uh, you know. And my father was a World War II; he was in the Navy, and uh, you know, he was out there in the Pacific Theater. Um, so it was uh, it was a very scary time, and uh, I don't think that anybody in the world wants to have that kind of time revisited. And having Russia. Uh, coming in and attacking Ukraine, first Georgia, then Ukraine, and the uh, the, the Crimea uh, Sea yeah. uh, area. Uh, that is, uh, you know, it's it's been a very tough situation for people in that area, trying to establish the fact that they are nation states now, and that they are uh, democracies, and uh, not wanting to go back to uh, being, uh, you know, somehow secondary to the power of Russia. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that they have been for quite some time. Like, I think in a lot of the political dialogue that's going on around the situation in Ukraine, at least from an American perspective, there's this idea of, like, well, they are in Russia's backyard. Like, it's true that they were a part of the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union existed. It's also true that Ukraine was one of the first countries to de declare its independence. And it's also true that the Ukrainian people have their own heritage and their own history that goes back to... I don't even know what century, and so I'm not going to say it, but it goes back considerably longer than the Soviet Union ever existed. And I think one of the things that we have a great fortune in our country, whether you live in Connecticut or Texas or anywhere else in this country, we have a clear date on the calendar that marks when our country started. Very few other countries actually have that. For most other countries, no matter where you are in the world, it was some evolution of some story. Kingdoms came and went, emperors came and went, kings, queens came and went. And at some point, you end up in the modern-day version of the country that we all live in. In our country, we have we, we celebrate it every year. It's coming up not so long away. Fourth of July, exactly, yeah. exactly. We do have that established, and we have uh, we have a very large land mass that is uh, quite rich in all types of uh, you know for agriculture, for minerals, for all types of things. Uh, so we have uh, we have the capacity to really take care of ourselves. And, uh, you know, I think that we'll be looking more and more at that as time goes on, uh, because I think we need to reestablish a lot of the uh, aspects of what we're capable of doing for 
Americans by keeping some of the work here, yet working yeah. internationally, too, because we have to keep those relationships established and good because it's, it's a, the world is much smaller than it was even 40 years ago. Uh, we're well, well together. Uh, so yeah. there's that. But the balances have to be uh, constantly looked at because it's quite difficult, really, to gauge all the different countries with all the different interactions and businesses and uh, politics and treaties. I mean, there is just yeah. an enormous amount of information to try and keep track of. And you, you've done a lot of that work uh, uh, when you're working uh, in, this, in the State House. That's right. So for those listening, basically after I left the Army, went to grad school, studied public policy and international relations, did two masters at Georgetown. And while I was there, I wanted to get a firsthand understanding of how we as a country do foreign policy. That was my head-scratching moment in Afghanistan. And I realized that, at least for the federal government, there's a lot you can understand from the outside looking in, but there's no better way of understanding it than being on the ground floor, being the one rolling up the sleeves, doing the work. And so I had a great privilege, privilege of going to work at the U.S. Department of State, where I got to manage our science and technology relationships with all the countries in North and South America. It's amazing. <laughs> and that, tell us a little bit about it, kind of break that down a little bit, because it's kind of almost mind-boggling to think of, um, of that, those relationships and the te technological aspects. Yeah. So in North and South America, 32 countries that we have relationships with, Canada, Mexico, Latin America, the Caribbean, and all of South America. And one of the things that, from a diplomacy perspective, and for those listening, if you want a working definition of diplomacy, it's basically how good or bad of a relationship does one country have with another and what can you do about it? Mm -hmm. And some of it kind of boils down to like middle school cafeteria politics. Who's at the cool kids table? Whose table do you really want to be at? But it's happening in the international stage. Yeah. And when other countries are interacting with our country, they may want just clarification on what is going on. They may want support. And from a science perspective, American science is one of the best brands we have. It is a thing that every scientist around the world wants to collaborate with American scientists. We do such amazing research here. Everything that makes your smartphone smart, invented in America. Because we did the research in order to invent global positioning satellites, to invent email, to invent text, me text messaging. And it's that sort of brand awareness, for lack of a better word, that we have in science as a country that we can use to open up the doors for having more difficult conversations with other countries at any given time. And it can, in a, I'll give you two real tactical examples or real tangible examples. When President Obama wanted to start a dialogue with the government of Cuba after decades and decades of mistrust that goes all the way back and probably before the Cuban Missile Crisis that we all know very well, whether you live through it or not. Um, the very first way that we reached out to them, from my understanding, is through public health. Mm -hmm. Every country has public health issues. We have some of the best, best public health professionals of anywhere in the world, as I think hopefully we've all learned over the last couple of years. And reaching out to them through public health allowed us to get a dialogue going that then we can turn around and talk about other things. Then we can talk about trade issues. We can talk about human rights. We can talk about security postures or whatever the case may be. But we got our foot in the door because we we're able to talk about public health, which affects us both because they are only 90 miles off our coast. And we sometimes forget that for other countries and a country like Mexico had a bit of a bumpy relationship with Mexico under the last administration. Well, Mexico has more earthquakes than we do as a country. We have some of the most amazing geological earthquake scientists, seismologists, I think is a proper term. And us getting access to their data about what is happening with earthquakes allows us to improve our models that predict where damage will happen from the sensors that we have in the ground. And then we can return those outputs of those models to the government in Mexico so that both us and Mexico, without anyone paying any extra money, can better understand where the damage is most likely to happen as soon as an earthquake is detected. And that just benefits everyone. And that's the sort of things and on top of managing the formal agreements we have, and I think there's six of them in North and South America to collaborate on scientific issues. We do a lot of research in the Amazon rainforest. Getting to go see the Amazon rainforest firsthand is awe-inspiring. Um, have and you getting, done that? I have. Oh, as that's wonderful. You've said so much. <laughs> yeah, representing the uh, 
U.S. and leading a group of American scientists to wow. look for more research cooperation opportunities is phenomenal. And then I think we often, as a country, take for granted the success stories of government. Mm -hmm. And I think science diplomacy and our scientific cooperation around the world is what allows us to have the level of medicine that we have. It's what allows us to have a lot of the things that we take for granted. But none of that, I, want, I shouldn't say none of it would happen. A lot of it happens better because we have serious diplomats, we have serious professionals, and we have serious scientists that are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work to make it work. Yeah, we do have a really great place here with Jackson Labs, and when we invested the money in Jackson Labs to look at the human genome and to be able to do more genomic research, uh, one of the things that came, um, and a lot of people complained about the money we invested in at the time, but after that we got grants internationally from all over the world to expand that type of research, and I think that this is uh, some of the some of the science we've done right here helped us with the COVID uh, crisis, uh, the pandemic pandemic, uh, because uh, with having that experience with the human genome, we were able to continue the research on doing the uh, the uh, type of uh, vaccinations that were developed uh, based on that human genomic uh, science. So, and of course, it's been going on since the 70s so right. with agriculture, yep. but, but you know, and people say, oh, it's new. I said, no, it's not new. It's been, this is genomic science has been going on for some time now. Yeah. And uh, of course, more successfully and more focused on humans near the end of the 19th 90s, uh, but uh, and then then the 2002 vaccination they started to develop for SARS too. But in any way, I don't no. mean to digress. I do want to talk a little bit about your focus in terms of all this wonderful experience you have uh, uh, internationally, and you can bring a lot of this uh, to uh, the capital here in Hartford. And yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about your vision and and your your you know. Uh, applying all this amazing knowledge that you have, that you have from the military experience, from your experience uh, going through graduate school, uh, learning about science in the state house, and all of this, I think that this will be a great asset to uh, people who are you know, really focused on the towns in the state. Yeah, I think a couple things. One, uh, the power of education is something that I know very personally, being the first one in my immediate family to graduate from a four-year institution and a pre decent one at that and being able to realize that just because you're born in a school district even in Connecticut that may not be the most well-resourced school district how do we get those kids opportunities because the town I grew up in Naugatuck not a very well-off school district when I was there it was towards the bottom of the list but I was still able to compete with students with Val Victorians from all over the country yeah. and Fundamentally, education for me isn't a political issue, it's a personal issue. And really relooking our education system to be able to tackle the complexity of the world that I know we live in from all my international experience, whether it's military or in the diplomacy realms, and really relook at it with a new perspective with my engineer hat on and say, how do we make this better to work better in a very pragmatic way? And then how we break that up into steps that can actually, one, get past, and two, get us into a better place because I think a lot of people are very wary of huge transformational change and rightfully so our systems we have even at the state level are complicated we have a complicated state yes, we have we do. millions of people that live here we have everyone on the economic spectrum you could possibly imagine in the state and so it's complex and to be able to recognize that separate the signal from the noise overcome the sensory overload that you might experience whether you're in the capital or skydiving <laughs> and look at it with the perspective of what is our North Star and how we break that up into digestible chunks and how do we actually move it forward and then let the system test itself out and see if it's working or not. And I think that very pragmatic engineering approach combined with some diplomacy skills, whether it's tackling our education system, which is something that I think should always be up for debate of how we can do education better. It's how do we make government more accessible and more easy to use for our farmers, for our small business owners, for those that don't have all of the resources in the world to throw at it to make sure to hire the right government affairs person to usher everything through the system. And how do we make government un more understandable, knowing that it's going to be complex. But I think we live in this day and age where a lot of our government systems, especially from a technology perspective, 
are really lagging from what the private sector is. And there's a lot of sometimes very sensible reasons for that, and sometimes there's a lot of just things that are built into any government bureaucracy that slows down change. And I think at the end of the day, the way I look at what I could do for people who are living in the 48th district is I can really put on a whole bunch of different hats all at the same time and look at problems the way that maybe not everyone else who's already in Hartford can look at it and ask some of the questions. I really believe in the power of asking questions and there's some really amazing representatives in Hartford already and there's some amazing representatives from both parties that are there trying to do good work. And I think adding a few more voices that have more diverse backgrounds who have seen it done in different countries and different towns all across the U.S. can really only help that process. I think you're right. I think there. I think everybody who runs for office, I, almost everybody anyway, sure. yeah. is really doing it because they they have a vision that they think will help with their society, with our society, with Connecticut, with their local community. And uh, that, that, is, uh, that is, I think, what everybody thinks. Um, so we're all very focused on understanding that, hey, that's your, your area, that's, you know, and you may have a different view. And I think that one of the things that's very, very good about being at the Capitol is people have that kind of respect and that kind yeah. of understanding. And um, I think that uh, uh, that's been my experience since I've been there. And no matter which side of the aisle, there's always that respect and um, that willingness to work. I mean, when it comes to a local community issue, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, everybody tries to help that local community uh, in terms of what their, might, their bonding need might be or something right. of that nature. So, so that's the kind of the way it works. And then when you get into the, the idea of education, which I'm on the education committee, right. uh, that is something that, you know, we've been working really hard to, to, to create funding equalization now yeah. so that we have the kind of balance for each town. Now, there was litigation, uh, Horton versus Meskel, uh, twice, uh, once in the 70s, once in the 80s, that created the education cost sharing grant. And, uh, you know, and then it was kind of put on, on, it was frozen in the 90s. And so, but we've we've reconstructed it and uh, we're going back to making sure there's equalization going on. And we will have a task force that will, you know, address the equalization uh, funding. But the one thing that I hope that we uh, work on some more, and this is right up your uh, alley, I believe, yep. is doing the manufacturing pipeline yep. uh, that we've done here in eastern Connecticut. And uh, I know uh, Senator Austin has been very focused on the manufacturing pipeline and making sure that our students uh, get to work over here at Electric Boat, that they get over to Pratt & Whitney or over to Sikorsky Aircraft and uh, get that engineering background and have these STEM, STEM uh, academies, STEM schools so that students who have these interests can can really get propelled right into uh, these different types of jobs. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think there's a perception out there you have to go to college in order to make ends meet. And I understand why that perception exists. If you look, there's a bunch of studies that show how much more money you can make. I think with the manufacturing that we still have here in Connecticut, you rattled off a couple important ones. Electric boat, making our nuclear submarines. Um Sorry, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek being a West Point grad. It is super important. <laughs> Let me just be on the record as saying that. Sikorsky helicopter. I mean, they've made helicopters where my soldiers were medevaced out on. So Sikorsky is very near and dear to my heart. And we have a bunch of other manufacturing opportunities. And it should be possible for a middle-class family to be able to go to public-funded education and go into a job that can support a middle-class lifestyle. And I think if you look at the national studies... Your average family of four right now has to work two and a half full-time jobs, which just isn't sustainable. Right, right. I think that that's absolutely true. I think what happened is because of the transition that happened in the 80s, well, when we, we, when we started giving uh, tax uh, credits to leave the country for the other types of manufacturing. No. Uh, and then uh, there was a feeling by a lot of people back then that, well, we can't go into manufacturing anymore because it's all overseas. Right. And uh, and so then uh, then we, we, we realized, hey, we have a lot of defense contracting here, and we probably should really be doing all our defense work here, I think, anyway. I don't think that we should yeah. be sharing a lot of this stuff with other, other places, let's say. I think that that should something 
be something we control. But in any event, um, I think that uh, having these these amazing places that we have in Connecticut that help us with defending ourselves, and I think it's mm -hmm. becoming more and more apparent to the public that we better take heed and, and, and really watch out for ourselves, uh, given some of the things that have been going on with Russia. And uh, and so I think well, that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, on that, and everyone has lived through the supply chain woes over the last couple of years, whether it's baby formula mm -hmm. or the price of lumber or anything else. And I think one of the things that we've learned over the last couple of years is two real things. One, you need to have a competitive market within our own country. So having a baby formula supplier that provides 48 or 49 percent of the country's supply of baby formula is probably not entirely smart just in case they end up having bacteria get into their supply and then um also what's not super great which is what you were just talking about is relying on other countries to supply things that we need for and i think it goes past defense i think it goes towards what the federal government would call critical infrastructure being able to provide our own energy and that has to mean not just fossil fuels. It has to mean geothermal, renewable right. energies. It has to mean a diverse energies flow that we can source from within our own country if we have to. Same thing with the chips that are in our smartphones or almost everything that we really need to make the country work, we should be able to supply for ourselves. And I think from a security standpoint, it's an imperative. And I think if we do that right, you'll see manufacturing jobs in places like Connecticut because we have highly trained welders and everything else that makes Electric Boat and Sikorsky so successful. And I think you'll see it take off. And I think one of the things that people forget about is, um, and this might be a little outdated, and this will be my last point, is that the most profit for manufacturing an iPhone goes to Germany because they're the ones with the human capital to make the chips that they need. It's assembled in China and sold in places like America. And I think that's a model that like, we as a state should really look at and make sure that our people, our students graduating, can have those sorts of opportunities, not just in college, but also through manufacturing. Oh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm here with Chris Rivers, who is the Democratic nominee for the 48th House District. He has amazing experience and uh, great ideas. And I hope to have you back because this has been a very, very informative conversation. And I know that you'll be a tremendous asset uh, at the State House uh, of Representatives here in Connecticut because of the amazing experience you've had in the military and with our, our national government. So I really appreciate you being here less. 10 seconds if you want to. Yeah, I would just say thanks for everyone listening, and please do f feel free to reach out. We're all about being approachable as a campaign and myself individually, and thank you for having me on the show. How do they reach you? ChrisRivers.com. All my contact info is there. All right. Very good. Thank you, everyone. This is Susan Johnson here with Chris Rivers, and uh, have a great week, and we'll be, at, be back next week with another wonderful show. Take care. <laughs>